I get started? I think everybody's gathered back together. I'll use the microphone because I have a little voice. Um, I didn't know if I needed a disclosure slide, so I threw one in there. But my one disclosure is that I finished this presentation about three minutes ago and almost induced a heart attack for poor Paul. But besides that, <laughs> then the EMS people could respond and we could save him and all will be well. And we will have done our duty here at this uh, conference. So we, our subcommittee had three goals. These were actually the goals that we had originally put into the um, initial application for the consensus conference and we carried through with exploring these as goals for our consensus conference. Um, the first was to explore research opportunities to determine whether established best practices for pediatric EMS care improved patient-oriented outcomes. We also had the goal of discussing best methods to ch study challenging but high impact conditions such as cardiac arrest, drowning, severe trauma, respiratory failure. And then lastly, um, to identify opportunities to translate knowledge and evidence into the pre-hospital setting. So these were a little lofty, um, as you can imagine, and so um, we ended up participating in this survey um, that was sent out uh, thanks to Chris Merritt, and this was kind of the um, uh, bar graph on those three goals to identify which ones were most important and on the lowest these were people were asked to rank um, these different things and you can see that the one bar in red got the most responses as first or second um, which was do established best practices for EMS care improve patient outcomes and as we discussed how we would uh, talk about this in our consensus conference we realized that probably what we needed to do was identify more specifically which pediatric EMS outcomes should be measured and that was what we wrapped our actual um, conference uh, breakout session around. Um, what we did is we um, had in our session, we divided um, our group up into four different clinical contexts, each um, with a signed men, uh, mediator, or sorry, not mentor or mediator, but a moderator, excuse me. Uh, um, I did sepsis and seizure. Um, we did general injury. We did head injury alone, given the importance of it and the high morbidity and mortality with severe TBI, and also the significant um, potential morbidity with minor TBI or mild TBI. And then we included respiratory disease and failure. We had a Twitter moderator, and she was rocking it the whole time. Um, we had a scribe who was amazing and already sent me um, a detailed notes from our um, conversation. And then we had a recording um, device so that we can go back and re-listen to things as needed. What we did is have our group um, count off into fours to divide. We each group went to a table where there were Sharpies and candy and Post-it notes and um, other things, um, and we asked them to brainstorm hard for 10 minutes on relevant outcomes for that given clinical condition. And then we had everybody rotate every 10 minutes. And the next group came up to the table. There were some that were already there. They could comment on them, add to them, um, embellish on them, and we were posting them on our, on our walls. Um, after everybody rotated through the four tables, we then uh, brought everybody around for a, a round of voting. And so the same groups rotated across all four tables um, and voted. And what we had was people voting with dots. They um, gave, everybody had four dots uh, for feasibility and four dots for importance of the given outcome. And so every participant got a total of 16 dots to work with. Um, they could put all their dots on one item if they wanted, um, and but it allowed us to grade the importance and the feasibility of some of the outcomes that we discussed were important to measure. And then finally, we went around as a group to each um, area and kind of identified which things really rose to the top um, along the, both of these categories. And so this was our method for driving consensus. This is a picture of um, our scribe and one of our subcommittee members and their son putting dots all over the place and that's kind of what our thing looked like at the end. Um, and you can see this was kind of how we laid ourselves out. Um, the other very nice thing is with our Twitter feed that was ongoing, if there was an, um, a tweet that came across, we actually put it up there so somebody could vote on it and we just marked it with a T so we could track which ones were Twitter comments and which ones were not. So I'll show you our, some of our results. Don't laugh, Manish. Okay. So we had 27 attendees to our group. Um, and it, in the social media piece, we had 21 tweets during our breakout session. And we had 10 commenter, commentators also on a EMS um, docs Facebook page um, on additional things. And then there were 43 comments back and forth. And we anticipate that over the next week or so, we'll have more social media input into this area. Um, unfortunately, the tweeters don't get 
dots. So we'll have to figure out how maybe what that looks like. But there were some general cross-cutting outcome measures, and I mentioned this um, during our luncheon um, panel group discussion that we identified, and most importantly was this need to link EMS to hospital data. Um, and unfortunately, I missed your talk because I was working furiously on these slides during your talk, but I know Canada has already done a lot of this. And in the United States, um, the way EMS systems are funded, the way they track their data, the purpose of their electronic PCR, if they're even on an electronic PCR, almost makes it virtually impossible to do this in many ways, at least systematically. We do have NEMSIS, but NEMSIS is de-identified. Only about 6% of all NEMSIS patients have outcome data attached, and that is very generic um, and only what a hospital submits to them if they're um, giving data to NEMSIS. So we really have a huge gap there that we need to try to figure out how to close. And for the funders in the room and the patient advocates in the room, if you could talk to your hospitals and encourage them on how important it is to figure this part out, that would be very helpful to EMS researchers. The other key thing that really rose to the top again and again and again was the need for EMS providers to be able to recognize the illness that they're treating. And again, for those of us in the education world, that is a little bit harder than we realize. When pediatric patients make up only 10% of all EMS encounters, and then among that population, they could have any or anything of, in terms of clinical condition, it really whittles down an individual EMS provider's experience on helping manage that kind of condition. So that really rose very high on how do we start to kind of fill in that gap as well. Uh, one thing that we noticed was that mortality and disability was identified as important, but for only two of the clinical conditions, and that was traumatic brain injury and sepsis. When we talk about respiratory illness and others, it really didn't rise to the top as a very important outcome. It's a very feasible outcome, um, as we all know, but it's, it, it wasn't deemed as where we should be really filling in the gaps in our studies. So this uh, looks very busy, and I apologize for that, but for our respiratory disease failure group um, or, or table, uh, we went through quite a bit of things. And again, because people got to vote on what was feasible to measure as an important out as an outcome and what was important, there are actually are areas where those things aligned and there are areas where those were very disparate. So for example, here, as you can see here, you know, non-invasive ventilation success rate you know, about 50% of the total number of votes were related to feasibility and about 50% were related to its importance. Similarly, for which superglottic area works and the importance of avoiding hypoxia and hypotension, there was a little bit of matching. But um, the general recognition of um, respiratory failure and distress was identified as very important, but again, not that feasible um, as, as something that we are always struggling with. And then another outcome here, the rate of using various interventions in respiratory distress, such as steroids, nebulizers, were identified as very feasible because we can look at what was given. It's all documented and recorded, um, but probably not as important um, in terms of an outcome measure. So we got a huge number, as you can see from this table, just in respiratory alone, and there were more that didn't even make it onto this slide of things that we'll be able to sift through and examine um, to identify where we're going to put our directions um, in uh, doing some additional research to fill in the important patient outcome gaps for uh, EMS um, interaction with patients. This is our general injury um, table. The other thing you can see is that my fancy little, you know, animations and red boxes disappear as the presentation goes on because I had less time to make it look fun. So, um, but you can see for general um, injury, you know, one of the things um, at the very top, the pediatric specific training, that was also a cross-cutting measure. Again, it, it goes along with the ability to recognize illness, but giving EMS providers pediatric specific information uh, and whether that is training on um, the progression of illness in kids, what ill kids look like, and or what um, kind of equipment to use in children did actually come up in many cases. It comes up particularly in general injury. Um, the other three things that um, came up were uh, hospital needy se selection, mortality, and um, EMS injury prevention activities. If you look at the bottom, however, you'd see that uh, interestingly, although that was very feasible, it wasn't actually considered as important. And I think maybe the feeling with EMS is that the house is out or the uh, horse is out of the barn at that point. Once the injury happens, the prevention activities are not, you know, really impacting the patient care at that point. And that's probably a bigger issue for communities um, and, uh, and, and other um, and hospitals. This is our information for seizure. 
Um, again, here, things that are in bold kind of identify which things were kind of got high, you know, votes overall. Um, the time to administer benzodiazepine wasn't actually seen as important as it was feasible. Um, and that's where there's a little bit of mismatch. But again, that recognition of seizing activity was kind of equally um, important and feasible that we really need to try to teach EMS providers how to recognize seizing children. I personally think that that's hard sometimes when they even are in the ER. You know, how often are you like, are they seizing? Do you think they're seizing? What's their tone like? Are they seizing still? <laughs> you know, have we all not done that? I, I do that every time. Okay, okay, so I'm just me. All right, good. Um, just checking. Uh, and so, and then finally, um, the percent of patients getting the med by the preferred route. This has actually been something that is coming up um, in PHARN uh, through a study being done by the CHAMP node um, with the rest of the EMS affiliates by Dr. Shaw, who is in our group. Um, that we don't really know which ones are the best routes to give these medications and often EMS traders are kind of anywhere and everywhere in what they choose and how they choose to give it. So we don't have a sense of how that actually ultimately impacts patients on, down the road. And then finally, this is our information on sepsis. Once again, early accuracy of identification, recognition, and early treatment rose at the top is so critical. Um, and then, in addition, the idea of, you know, getting that fluid um, administered uh, as quickly as possible also rose um, up to the top as something that got a lot of votes. You'll see that the disposition outcome of where they go wasn't actually as important, but mortality did um, uh, rise to a level of importance for sepsis overall. So, um, in conclusion, we felt like we had a pretty good, you know, vibrant discussion, um, and uh, we had an opportunity for people to, you know, be able to objectively put their information down, um, and it was a lot of fun, I think, for our group. Uh, and we found some cross-cutting measures that are, we have identified that are pretty important that we hope that we can do some uh, work on to kind of move the needle forward on pediatric EMS care. And thank you. Appreciate it. No, I, I agree. And I think, though, that um, one of the things about seizing, you know, for EMS, most of the patients are not seizing anymore by the time EMS gets there. And, um, and so then, so one, there's the recognition piece, like, you know, that debate of, like, do I need to treat it? And then, so that may be kind of impacting time. But two, the bigger issue is, like, you know, a fear of, oh, you know, do I give him a shot? Do I try to put an IV into the kid? He looks fine now. Do I just squirt something up the nose if he doesn't need it? So that's where some of those medication route ideas are kind of rising, I think, above that in terms of treatment. Well, thank you guys very much. Appreciate it. While they're walking up here, I just want to comment that I think we got some amazingly skilled slide presenters. Wow, look how fast they did that. It's amazing. All right. Bringing the whole committee. That's good. Yes. Oh, it's okay. Sure. Don't worry. It's okay. Right? It's okay. It. No, it's okay. Right. It's okay. So, um, good afternoon. It's the end of the day. You're very tired. You've heard this many, many, many times. Um, we changed our name. We are ED Collaboration. And on stage, I have my team here, um, which um, I need to introduce. We have Mark Auerbeck, Josephine Madeline, Madeline Joseph, uh, Moon Lee, Kim Mears, Cami McCoon, tired, huh? Dinah Wallen, Lee Benjamin, Ryan Hartman, 
who is a second year emergency medicine resident that volunteered to do this, and of course, Paul and um, Kurt. Um, it has been a long journey. Um, we started this two years ago, and uh, we've had many meetings, um, many discussions, and this afternoon really culminated the work of uh, two years. Um, it has been extraordinary work by our committee and extraordinary work by the people that are here this afternoon and that participated. So we will um, basically spare you a lot of the details of you know, what, how we did it, what we did, but really the goals are um, that we want to enhance the collaboration of all emergency departments. We want pediatric specific emergency departments and general emergency departments to work together. We want to understand the challenges. We want to bring all the stakeholders to the table and we want to provide better care for children. So those are very lofty goals. We ended up settling in with four different themes and one of them was about quality. So how do we define quality? And someone on our group um, said it's, it's very simple. You just have to come up with a couple of quality specific measures, start with those and thread them through the care in every emergency department. Let's start small and aim big. I could actually just finish talking and just say we just need to do what the Terry Klassen did in Canada and we're done. <laughs> so I don't know Terry, I love listening to you but I was like wow two years later and we could have just done what they did in Canada. So that was pretty awesome and it was pretty sobering to come to the conclusion that it has taken us so long to even start thinking about this process so it's quite incredible. Um, so we um, think that one of the important things and that we need to discuss is that um, quality also comes with dollar signs. It comes with incentives. It comes with implementation science. And we discuss very extensively how do we address this because um, basically um, in order to make things work, um, you do need money, you do need to, to get it to where you want it to be. And, and I think these are some of the challenges um, that were discussed in all the different groups. And it was really interesting that in the end we had four separate groups that actually came to very similar conclusions within our breakout session. And we came to very similar conclusions to all the other breakout sessions. So basically we are talking about collaboration, we're talking about networks, we're talking about really using what already is there and building from those networks. Um, we wanted to be certainly um, patient oriented and we talked a lot about QI collaboratives and, and how do we establish them and how do we measure um, that it's making a difference and I think that is quite difficult. Um, we also talked quite extensively how do we make it happen in no volume emergency departments because that is truly the challenge. Um, there are so many conflicting demands on this emergency departments and a lot of them are associated with dollar signs. There are tons of CMS reporting that <laughs> they have to accomplish in order to get that money and it's very important how do we make it happen for pediatrics so it is as important for those emergency departments to get the dollars the dollar the dollars that are going to make them function um, we talked quite a lot about challenges and barriers in developing a system of care in general emergency departments and we um, really talked a lot about mentorship and partnership about having resource accessible and we talked about outcomes and those are were quite difficult. Some of the outcomes we talked about were for example decreasing the number of transfers uh, to, to and from different emergency departments because certainly that is a way that you could decrease healthcare utilization, that you could decrease healthcare dollars, um, that you could increase patient satisfaction and patient experience reduce the stress of these families that are being displaced to go to faraway places only to be sent home. Um, we talked a lot about knowledge translation and how do we accomplish that 
And one of the things that we talked about was that um, we are not actually trying to use the networks that already exist. And a lot of the hospitals are in very extensive networks that um, could be used as your first step without even spending one dollar, just using those networks, just using the data, just bringing together emergency departments of very different volumes in collaboration with the children's emergency department and have that work go back and forth and have the children's emergency departments work with general EDs in actually designing those guidelines before they are published and they are established. So um, that is something that just really requires some work on part of all of us, but not really money, which is always an issue in funding. Um, so how do we establish these networks? What are the barriers? And I think we spend quite a bit of time in our groups talking about the stakeholders. And we, we have talked a lot about that today and here, but I don't know how much is understood outside of this room that the stakeholders are very numerous and that really have such an important part of this agenda and this research agenda that we're developing, starting with the patients and going all the way through the continuum of care for the pediatric patient. And again, we, we talked about these guidelines and the standardization of care and the collaboration. And something that has really come so much into the conversation, uh, we have to stop the them versus us. We are one. So this classification of, it, it really, it brings us into silos and barriers. And if you think of bringing all these resources together, how much further could we go with just what we have, with all the organizations that are already vested in, in caring for children and, and in, in having the safety and the care of children in, in the vision and mission of their organizations? We need to bring them together. And then we um, talked uh, in another one of the groups about pediatric readiness and its effects on patients' outcomes. And this comes up quite frequently because we know that um, having a pediatric coordinator, physician or nurse or both, uh, changes the readiness. But how do you go one step further in not just changing what kind of equipment you have, but what kinds of outcomes? And what are the outcomes? And how do you optimize uh, technology to help that collaboration and that exchange of knowledge? And again, money comes up again. Uh, financial incentives to provide quality of care. And so we have ahead of us um, quite a long road, but as we heard this afternoon, it's something that can be done and it's done already. We have Nate Cooperman with the Research Network and, and all his team. We have Terry Klassen. We have many lessons here um, that the, tra the road has already been traveled. We just have to learn it how to travel it for our goals that we want to achieve for the different groups that we talked about today. And um, in conclusion, I just um, look for really um, learning from all of you, from working together, and so that we can keep the synergy that we achieved here at this conference um, going and really establishing this network that we are so fiercely looking for. Thank you, and I'll let my team be open. I was going to make a joke. Research has like all the graphs and all the things we're like, we qualitative. <laughs> Workforce. Thank you. Um, so I think I'm the last.
before you guys close this out, so I'm going to do my best to keep it brief. Um, we, uh, we had a, a really uh, great discussion um, about sort of the future of the pediatric emergency care workforce. Um, and I think it was Rich Ruddy who um, made the comment that um, we were trying to plan for the pediatric emergency care workforce for the next 10 to 15 years, um, but we, what we don't know is what's the work going to be in 10 to 15 years. And so um, we can plan and, um, and, and predict, and I think it'll be really interesting to see um, to see how close or far off the mark our predictions are. Um, I want to thank um, Isabel, our scribe, um, Mary Kay, our um, patient advocate who worked with us um, and really contributed to a lot of the discussion today, and everybody else on this subcommittee um, for all the hard work over the last couple of years, as well as our fearless leaders. Um, so we had identified a, a number of um, a number of sort of themes, as many of the groups did, um, within our uh, our topic area of the pedi of pediatric workforce development. Um, we uh, wanted to talk a little bit about the epidemiology of the pediatric workforce. Uh, in other words, like who's taking care of the kids and where and when. Um, we thought it would be important to talk about burnout and strains on the pediatric workforce um, as contributing to either retention or loss uh, of uh, members of the workforce. Um, we wanted to have a discussion about readiness in the context of um, sort of workforce readiness and personnel um, and much in sort of it, it coinciding with um, what Isabel's group talked about as well. Um, we had interesting discussions about career pathways into the pediatric workforce and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and we wanted to have discussions about the, uh, the roles um, of advanced practice providers in pediatric emergency care, uh, PAs and MPs and others. Um, and in fact, one of our, uh, Fred Wu, who couldn't be here today, um, is a, a physician assistant um, who works in emergency medicine and is involved in the national um, organization for phys uh, sort of re emergency research um, among PAs um, and really contributed to a lot of our planning. Um, I'm going to briefly talk about the, uh, the sort of the process. Um, we did, um, we, so, you know, a group of us um, sort of identified those themes within, within the work, you know, sort of under the workforce umbrella. Um, and we wanted to sort of reach out to hopefully many of you and others um, who may or may not have been able to make it to this conference um, to sort of get their input and make sure we weren't too far off the mark. Um, and I think we felt like uh, people the, the themes that we identified sort of resonated with people. Um, we started our breakout um, session with um, a poll of sort of, you know, trying to identify which of those themes might be of highest priority to the individual people in the, in the breakout session, and I'll show you that in a moment. Um, we followed that with a discussion, and we tasked, um, we had three, uh, three um, groups with, breakout groups within our session, um, and we tasked them with identifying um, the highest priority themes and then the, uh, prioritizing a series of specific research questions within those themes. And we are still in the process of prioritizing um, that agenda. So if there are folks who are in the workforce um, breakout session who haven't yet responded to my email, please do. Thank you. Um, so this is um, sort of what we opened with. You can see that there were the 21 participants. That was um, everyone in our session. Um, and there's clearly a lot of interest in um, what are the sort of strains and stressors that might lead to burnout um, within the workforce and how can we um, either change working conditions, change the uh, sort of what we're asking of, our, uh, of the people taking care of kids um, or other conditions um, that might lead to burnout, stress, um, and strains on the workforce. Um, but there was really an, uh, a broad interest across all of the themes, and I think even though we asked each of the small groups to discuss, to sort of identify two, two of the high, the, their two highest priority um, themes, I think every group discussed probably every um, aspect of this at some point during our session, and I, it was, there was a really rich discussion that, um, that took place. 
Um, some specific um, questions that will populate our research agenda um, have to, uh, I've, I've put these in no particular priority order yet, um, although we're working on that. Um, in terms of epidemiology, people were interested in assessment of clinical workload um, and particularly at how that might change as a function of uh, age. Um, not age of the patients, but age of the providers. <laughs> um, where are the pediatric patients? And pediatric patients in quotes, meaning like not only where are they, but how do we define what a pediatric patient is and is that definition fluid? Um, uh, we, there, were, there was several discussions about the, um, about the roles of telehealth uh, in sort of expanding the workforce into areas uh, of need, um, as well as discussions of urgent care um, and other, uh, other sort of locales or settings in which we might be uh, taking care of kids in need. And there was interesting discussion of both the pros and the cons of sort of the regionalization of care that we have all sort of seen um, as sort of, you know, the big children's hospital meccas become the sort of referral centers um, and what that means for uh, pediatric care outside of those sort of regional centers. Um, and so when we talk about how do we mitigate the effects of regionalization, there was some sense that there were probably some very good effects of that and probably some maybe unintended consequences of that, both for the care of the patients and the workforce. In terms of readiness, um, we, there was discussion of what sort of minimum skill sets needed, um, and I like this phrase, the care of, especially within care deserts, um, which is I, just a great turn of phrase because it sort of brings to mind like areas where there's just uh, not a lot of um, available care for kids who might be in need. It doesn't mean that the kids aren't there, it's just the care may not be. Um, how would we uh, establish minimum standards for facilities and for individuals? Um, and then there was interesting discussion about sort of career pathways to sort of how would you optimize, like define the optimal career pathway um, uh, for pediatric workforce. There was great discussion of burnout and strain um, and uh, it felt therapeutic, I think, for some of us is to sort of be able to vent, but it's also highlighted some of what, um, what, what, are, really, what are real strains on, on those of us who care for kids um, in, the, in the environments in which we do. Um, so talking about improving recruitment and retention uh, of clinicians, talking about um, leadership and what the effects um, of leadership might have on uh, sort of um, what effects sort of lo uh, loss of members of the workforce might have might mean for retention of leaders, um, at both academically, clinically, administratively. Um, factors that lead to burnout. And then there were interesting discussions of um, career pathways into the into the pediatric emergency medicine sort of subspecialty workforce. Um, what did what does a pediatric emergency doctor need? Um, and it certainly raised many questions and um, I'm not sure, and I think it'll be interesting to see how we uh, sort of arrive at some of the answers to these questions. Um, what does it mean, you know, does, does, a, um, does a, is a three-year fellowship necessary? Um, are, there, are there different career pathways for people with different goals and aims um, or different career aspirations? And then there was a sort of a, a topic of discussion around um, development of a more specifically an academic or research workforce. Um, and what are the factors in our chosen sort of careers that might either um, facilitate or hinder uh, success in that realm? Um, and how are we to plan for uh, maintaining the important research workforce um, of which we are a part? This is just the very beginning of sort of the prioritization polling and it's um, uh, incomplete, but um, we're starting to get a sense of which of these things folks are most interested in uh, or prioritizing. Um, and I'm, we will certainly have more uh, detailed information as we 
finish collecting this data from our folks. Um, and with that, I am going to call it a day. But thank you to everyone for, who participated.